Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's ILTA webinar, Securing Your Firm's Reputation, IT Res Resiliency Workshop. Our speaker today is Pat Spencer from InterVision, and I want to thank InterVision for sponsoring today's webinar. Today's presentation will run about 45 to 60 minutes, and we ask that you please submit all of your questions to the Q&A box, and they will be answered at the end of the presentation. Before we start, please know that we're recording today's session and we'll post a link to our website under recordings shortly after today's presentation. At the end of the presentation, we ask that you please take a few moments to complete the evaluation. I'll now turn the webinar over to Pat. Marcia, thank you. And just as a test, Marcia, can you hear my voice okay? Yes, you sound great. Thank you. Uh, appreciate everyone joining us today for securing your firm's reputation IT resiliency workshop. Uh, the goal of today's workshop is really to help you prepare for conversations. Uh, to understand how to have that conversation with others within your organization to really move your IT uh, department forward with the things that you're being challenged to do on a daily basis. Uh, again, my name is Pat Spencer and I'm the Area Vice President uh, for East Region and also Public Sector for Intervision. I've uh, been in sales for about 25 years uh, and uh, sold uh, everything from SaaS to infrastructure uh, to now doing uh, solutions with regards to uh, really more strategic services uh, for our clients. And uh, so hopefully um, you all don't have a uh, um, opinion on uh, salespeople and hopefully if you do, I'll be able to shine above the hat. So uh, let's move forward here. Uh, one of the things to uh, point out is Blue Lock was uh, an original gold sponsor of ILTA. So for some of you, you may know us as Blue Lock, uh, and we were acquired by InterVision in March of 2018. Uh, and so now I'm very proud to be part of uh, this company and be able to provide uh, more holistic solutions uh, on security and resiliency for our clients. So there's an adage that Rome was not built in a day, but they were laying bricks every hour. Uh, and, and that really uh, kind of stood out to me in thinking about this workshop, especially with regards to security and law firms and some of the challenges that you have uh, that you're uh, fighting on a daily basis. You know that really there is no end game with security. It's going to continue to evolve and change and adapt which is why it's even more mission critical to have the right conversations uh, with your constituents within your organization, within your firms, um, so that you can get the tools, the services, and really the expertise that you need to safeguard your firm's reputation. So we're going to talk about the way, but Marsha, I think you have a poll for us, uh, for our attendees to take a look at answering. And what we want to do is say, Take a look at what is the average frequency that you receive security audits from your clients. Is it one per week, per month, per quarter, or you really don't receive them? So if you could go ahead and, and choose the most appropriate answer for your firm, and then we'll take a look at the results. Okay, great. So. Uh, the one thing is, is I see a couple people that have not received them yet, uh, and, and which is, in, as we take a look at the total number, um, it, it really does relate well to what we see in the industry. And, and that is, I'd say 80% of those folks in the marketplace are receiving these types of security audits from clients. Uh, and we're seeing the frequency increase. Now, some of this will also be based upon the type of clients that you have, right? Uh, if you're doing healthcare, financial services, we see those organizations really moving towards wanting to make sure that their law firm is doing things that they see within their information security policies as appropriate uh, and as necessary uh, to make sure that their data is safeguarded and that to make sure that the law firm is following the same compliance guidelines that they have to. Um, so I appreciate you uh, jumping in on that and providing that data. Uh, I think that's good for everyone to see that this is uh, something that it will continue to increase. And so let's talk about the way in terms of uh, uh, what we see uh, law firms, uh, we, we think about what the attorneys are thinking about even in today's environment with regards to uh, security. So as we take a look at their lens, we realize uh, not only do you have their client picture, but then you also have the actual attorneys, the opinions, and some of the guidelines that they have to follow through with and they have to abide by. Uh, 
then you have uh, in the middle one, you know, I, we just received this large audit uh, from our largest client. How do we comply with regs, even though we're not in banking? How do we comply with FFIEC? And to the ones at the far right, how do we comply with HIPAA? What does that mean for us that we have to do? How long do we have to keep data? Um, you know, where does it have to be encrypted? Uh, at what level do we need to be able to retain that uh, and store that information? So we realize there's lots of things that you're trying to consider as you're working through this uh, scenario of safeguarding the, the firm's data, the firm's reputation, and your client data as well. So that being the case, let's, let's talk about today's threat landscape, but we're going to toss up another poll question just to kind of level set. So we know there's a lot of security audits that are taking place out there. Uh, now let's talk about the conversations that you're having. So do you have regular conversations about your security requirements? And this is really internal to your stakeholders, uh, possibly the clients, uh, but most probably the managing partners, IT committees, things like that. So if we could go ahead and take a vote, let's see what we've got here. Okay, so this is good to see. So 80% of you, 82% of you are having regular conversations with regards to security requirements. And we're gonna see some of this information pan out in even the ILTA uh, survey that they do, we'll see some things with that uh, really indicate that these conversations are taking place uh, from a survey perspective, but it's really good to get your feedback as being feet on the street and these conversations that need to take place are taking place. So as we think about the conversations, one of the things we'd like to do is really just take a look at uh, top causes of declared disasters. So as you're talking about security, that gets into data protection, it gets into resiliency, and so one of the things we like to share is, you know, what are those top causes of when someone's actually pushing the button? These are not uh, the top natural disasters, but these are ones where people have actually had to declare. And so you can take a look at really what the mix of this is. And again, a lot of this information is really for you to share uh, as you are having the conversations. We want to try to enhance and maybe broaden the topics that you might be speaking to. And as you'll notice in this, uh, you know, again, IT failure, natural disaster still climb at the top of it. And within IT failure, we're really talking about the equipment. Uh, and it might be a, a router that goes out. It might be a, a firmware upgrade that didn't go well and, and the, um, you know, the manufacturer, uh, you know, basically messed something up and now you're paying the price for it. But in addition to that, we talk about, you know, telecom failure, fire, utility outage. Know the cyber attack only 5% of the time has that turned into uh, having to declare. Now, obviously, we know that that number is going to go up. This is actually uh, kind of a mid-year number for 2019, and we know that that number is going to uh, begin to tweak up as these attacks get a, a little bit more direct, more vicious. Um, and so hopefully we, we can provide some data today and some information today about how to mitigate that. So this is a little bit of an eye chart, and so I do apologize for that, but this is actually from the Delta uh, survey. But uh, besides encryption and common antivirus software, which of the following security measures does your firm use? And, and the feedback that we got from your industry uh, really is about removing desktop administrative uh, rights, intrusion uh, detection system, uh, in addition to that, IPS a little bit further down there, two-factor authentication, phishing and social engineering tests of, of end users, uh, and uh, you can see uh, server log retention, uh, DLP or data loss prevention. So really a broad category of things that the law firms are taking a look at trying to implement, trying to get in place uh, to safeguard the environment. Uh, all of these things cost money. All of these things need to have a strategy behind the usage of them. And all of these things are, are broad and across your infrastructure and network today. Uh, but as you can see, this, this list isn't inclusive. These are just some of the higher ones that are being uh, utilized today with, across the industry. In terms of challenges that we hear, so we talk to a lot of law firms uh, you know, throughout the year, uh, be it at Delta Roadshows or at DeltaCon or clients of ours or prospects that we're working with. And, and really, these are the things that, that we see in terms of policy alignment, uh, government uh, governance misalignment that the 
a little bit of the recurring theme that you're going to see in here is the teams that you have to deal with. And it was honestly uh, these challenges that really uh, brought to fruition the idea that maybe we should do a webinar around how to have the conversation. Because if we see staff not using uh, the policies as they are in place, if we see leadership not necessarily considering all the risks with regards to uh, you know, data protection, uh, if we see employees not taking the phishing uh, test and then kind of the employee education around the security testing seriously, what we know there can be, uh, unfortunately, uh, bad repercussions. And so as we take a look at these challenges, we realize uh, that a lot of this uh, tends to lean towards that human side. And so if that's the case, how can we work with them to have them understand what you're trying to do each and every day? And as we go through this, I'll go through some stories of um, you know, real life use cases and clients that we will share that have to do with uh, really some things that have gone well potentially and others that didn't go so well. We, other, we also realize the other challenge that you have is, is the staffing piece. Uh, and this is something we see uh, at InterVision. We sell to not just legal industry, but financial services, healthcare, manufacturing, media and entertainment, and, and other various verticals. Uh, but we do see within the legal industry, based upon kind of a, a per FTE, uh, that the legal industry is, is short on resources. And I'm probably preaching to the choir here, uh, but you, you most, most of the ones that we talk with wish they had more staff. And that's true whether it's a larger firm, a medium-sized firm, or a smaller firm. And so we do realize that uh, uh, you've got some uphill challenges, uphill battles with regards to your staffing. And so some of the things we'll talk about, hopefully, can uh, be an extension of your IT team in terms of some of the tools that are out there today. So IT resiliency, very broad category, and we realize it's a balancing act. Uh, so what do we mean by that? Uh, we, we take a look, you know, sometimes at the very highest level, we have to take a look at resiliency versus agility. Uh, so an example of that would be, uh, you know, if, if your law firm is possibly doing software development or you have a lot of API that you're doing a lot of call outs for maybe your document management system, maybe for e-discovery, et cetera, you want to be able to move quickly. You want to be able to move quickly, gather the data, uh, run the reports, get the information to the attorneys or the clients, and, and so that takes an agile approach. Uh, um, but you have to really balance that with how safe, secure do you want to be with resiliency. And so you, we realize there's a pendulum. If you went you know, really far into the resiliency, it certainly is going to have an effect on your agility, and likewise, our uh, opposite of that is if you really go towards flexibility and agility to be able to do a lot of different things within your environment, your resiliency is it's going to have an effect there as well. Now, to take that a little bit further, we're going to focus on that resiliency side, and we really take a look at two, uh, two key factors, and that is uh, preventative uh, and restorative. But we realize that underneath all of this, you have detection. And there are tools, uh, whether it's uh, the most uh, basic uh, uh, tools, a, a SIM product that is doing the detecting where you're actually uh, able to audit the logs and so forth. Um, we realize that that bridges the gap between what you're able to prevent and how you're able to restore. Uh, all three go together. And the way they go together is what we refer to as a two-pronged resiliency framework. Uh, and again, a lot of this is going to be very straightforward for you, but again, think of this in terms of using this as a tool to have the right conversations with the right people so you can get them to lean into what you're trying to get done across the law firm. Uh, and so let's, let's kind of dig into this a little bit. As we take a look at some of the approach factors, the things that we want you to be able to take away today is, is realizing the how and the how of what you want to do and what you want to get done with regards to resiliency is really your people, your process, and your technology. Uh, and you are uh, really focused in on the people side of it based upon the IT committees and the managing partners and so forth. Uh, and the what being the strategy that you want to deploy and then the who, or those are the people that you've got to convince of what you want to try to get done. So kind of keeping that framework in mind, we take a look at those things that are preventative measures, threat management, access control, endpoint protection. 
not going to go through all of these. You guys know what these tools are. But this is a way of explaining all the things you're doing to prevent uh, something from going wrong. Whether it's uh, ransomware, uh, whether it is uh, you know something uh, coming in off of uh, you know from a, from a possible employee, uh, you're you're really trying to take a look at mobile devices. So again, in an explanation of these are the things that we're doing today to prevent, uh, and then we move into uh, those things that you're doing to detect. So what's there bridging that gap? Um, you know, do you have active log monitoring and response? Are you doing things to monitor the network traffic? Uh, and then do you have either internally or externally a team that can review the logs and actually make uh, you know, real-time decisions on possible changes that need to be done from a technology perspective? And then finally, we get into the restorative side. Uh, where, you know, if this is really more or less a continuum, right? So the slowest way to restore would be backups. If all you had were backups and possibly even tape backups, that certainly is going to be slower than at the other end of the pendulum where it's active-active. And so there's no right or wrong answer. And, and below that, you'll see on-premise, co-location, public cloud, private cloud, because we realize these tools can sit and rest uh, really at, at any level of these. And so the discussion is around how are we preventing, and there have been times with uh, some law firms that we visited with where there is a lot that's spent on prevention. Uh, and it might be that the managing partners went to a conference and, and learned about these things, such as employee education, awareness, and training. You know, things that you can do up front to mitigate against, um, you know, ransomware. And, and they come back and, and you get budget for those preventative tools. But when it comes to you know hardening the resiliency of maybe your, either your storage array or your networking environment, uh, or maybe trying to move uh, from doing things yourself to a DRAS or a managed DRAS environment, uh, we realize that's where the dollars you know tend to slow down because it may not be understood what is that value if they've already gotten into the system, right? So let's take a look at the two-prong framework uh, kind of in use. So again, as we take a look at the two-prong approach, prevention uh, with restoration, with detection bridging the middle, we realize that some of the verticals that you're going to try to protect and try to have conversations around will be your network, uh, will be the applications, uh, will be potentially any type of cloud. Uh, it could be SaaS solutions that you're currently utilizing. Uh, most certainly your data and your information. So governance around that, uh, and then obviously the risk and compliance. So if you are in a situation where you have those verticals that you have to abide by their policies with regards to uh, either regulatory or compliance perspective. So those are the verticals. And so as we step back and take a look at you know securing the infrastructure. So again, all this is for purposes of having that with the right conversation where uh, you know, most folks that are non-technical will understand you have to have firewalls in place. Uh, and especially from you know, the IT committees and the managing partners and so forth. So that being the case, just understanding, uh, you know, are we evaluating those? Um, have, we, have we sized them up? Are we taking full advantage of the configurations that the firewalls allow? Um, you know, in terms of east-west traffic management, and be able to utilize micro-segmentation, uh, and, and then even the advanced threat detection and prevention solutions, um, so the advanced uh, IPS and IDS that you have the ability to have, and then how far can you actually take that until it gets to a human review for certain things that they might be seeing. Um, so really, the, the concern or the, the goal is to be able to take these types of topics and put them into the model of, on the preventative side, we're spending you know, X dollars uh, on these types of things, or we need to go after these types of solutions in order to better safeguard and prevent. Same is true when it comes to securing cloud. So uh, many of the law firms we talk to do have a, a cloud uh, security framework, uh, both for SaaS solutions uh, or potentially they themselves going into an AWS or an Azure environment. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we're very cognizant of what is our current cloud strategy. We know that in some of the larger law firms that we've come across and consulted with, we've seen where there's been 
rogue is probably a strong word. Uh, there is certainly approval given to go into Azure or AWS and then provide for, uh, you know, basically either doing a lab, possibly QA, some test dev and those types of environments. Uh, but we want to understand what are we actually doing? What does that mean in terms of this framework? Securing the data itself. Uh, and this obviously, again, uh, applies to both what you may have on-prem as well as in the cloud. But we want to talk about the data security compliance. Uh, do you have pen tests that are done? Do you have vulnerability scans uh, that are done across the environment? So you can get that third-party opinion on how secure your data is. Um, and then we get into the data protection and recovery. How quickly could you recover? Uh, you know, we, I was with one law firm in Atlanta that was looking at trying to do disaster recovery as a service. And in the meeting with the managing partners, a comment was made that, well, we haven't had the disaster in 16 years since we had the ice storm. And I could just see that the head of our CIO just kind of low, get lowered a little bit because he realized that managing partner really didn't understand all the things that his team is doing day in and day out to safeguard the environment and, and that things have evolved. They were ones that were getting client security audits on a weekly basis and they were being asked to comply and make changes in their firewall configurations uh, and they were uh, being asked to make sure encrypt, uh, and data was encrypted in transit at rest. Um, and so having these conversations and understanding where this fits into this uh, framework will ease that conversation conceptually with your, uh, with your constituents. And securing people in the process, as we talked about before, people, process, and technology uh, it is, is really uh, the how of what you're trying to get done. So identity access management, a lot of things going on with that uh, in today's environment, a lot of new tools out there hitting the marketplace. Um, again, the governance, risk, and compliance, you know, are the people just, you know, as up to speed as what your technology is? Uh, you know, is there you know, a vendor risk assessment? Is there uh, a way to make sure that any technology brought into the law firm uh, goes through a certain review uh, uh, to make sure that it fits and, and meets the requirements of, of what you need to, need to have? And then obviously uh, the employee training, all kinds of tools out there as well. So let's, let's talk about some, some real life stories here uh, with regards to what we've seen. Uh, yeah, you know, in these final, in this uh, final minutes that we've got here. So large health insurance provider and rogue law firms. In this case, we had a large health insurance uh, uh, client of ours um, where they believe that they had done a good job trying to get their information security policy up to speed. And they dealt with obviously, um, you know, a few dozen different types of law firms. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, what they were finding out is that some of the law firms uh, you know, were not complying with the client's security audits. And in those cases, uh, they ended up leaving those law firms. Um, one, because the, you know, they provided a security audit and they were completed, but it was not to the, you know, what they found out, it wasn't to the depth of what they needed just from a, a compliant perspective. Uh, and so, in that case, you know, if you have those clients, um, the, the feedback that we got from the health insurance provider is, uh, you know, if the law firm couldn't meet it or felt they couldn't meet it by 100%, they really wanted them to reach out and have a partnership and, and try to understand what they could do. It wasn't going to necessarily be something that where they were going to leave them just because they couldn't comply. They just wanted to know really where, uh, where they were in the continuum of trying to make sure they could secure the data based upon, you know, healthcare regulations and HIPAA. Um, I've shared with you a little bit the mid-sized law firm with a 16-year no disaster. We realize you're working to stave off disasters every day, and sometimes those disasters happen, but because you have the safeguards in place, they don't make its way to the uh, managing partners or the IT committee because for you, it's a day in the life. But sometimes what we try to consult with the IT teams is sometimes you've got to take those things forward and, and share those things. So it, it's, it is one thing from an aging partner or IT committee perspective that no news is good news, but sometimes the news needs to be shared so they have an understanding of exactly what all you're trying to do uh, so that you may be able to get that latitude of bringing in a partner or a tool or a product or a uh, provider that can enhance or more or less uh, improve the resiliency of the law firm. 
Um, so try to uh, think of that in terms of, you know, the more education they have, the better it is. And we see that improving dramatically over the last few years in terms of IT bringing forward kind of everything they're trying to do. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we, we felt this framework would be, would be a good discussion point. Um, healthcare company finds um, service provider uh, jumped the gun. And so in this scenario, it was a provider uh, that did not follow the security policies of the healthcare company. Uh, so essentially they allowed a jump server to go out to download some uh, Adobe applications for, uh, or basically Java applications so that they could uh, begin prepping a, uh, EMC, a piece of EMC gear. Uh, but the jump server is not protected. So guess what? When they connected, uh, the SIM on the healthcare provider side went through the roof, uh, understanding that, that um, uh, it was unprotected and they were getting all kinds of malware coming through. Uh, so big, big mistake there uh, by that provider in terms of not following through with that. Now, that no, doesn't necessarily apply to the law firm, but what it does, uh, what it does indicate is, one, as you have vendors coming in, make sure they're following your information security policy, uh, whether it's for connectivity, uh, whether it's for you know, getting access to your environment, make sure that they've got a process in place. In fact, one of the things that we actually do is a security run book. We do disaster recovery run books, um, but on larger projects where there are just some complications in terms of connectivity, we actually do a security run book. Uh, it, it's uh, more extensive than a checklist uh, just because of the nuances of the uh, size environment that we're dealing with. So just something to consider there. Uh, large regional bank discovers no recovery at law firm partner. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, and and um, they gave, uh, again, this is where the, the law firm uh, uh, was very forthcoming. And the regional bank said, okay, I can, we can give you nine to 12 months, but it's got to be in place by then. And so we were able to step in with the law firm and deliver on a disaster recovery as a service solution within that time frame uh, to where they were able to continue doing business with that larger uh, regional bank. Uh, this one is, is a little concerning. It's one of those things, well, what do you do in this scenario? And it, it comes back to just like you have redundancy in your environment, you got to have redundancy across your employees as well. Uh, but this is uh, one that uh, I was personally involved with where I was trying to connect with the CIO of a law firm and, and he wanted to have a conversation. We were both at the same conference, um, but I kept getting you know, text messages from him. I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to meet today. Um, you know, something came up. Uh, long story short, he ended up having to leave the conference and we met up uh, later uh, in their offices. What happened was that a, a employee um, got disgruntled. Uh, because of where he thought the technology team was going and, 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 uh, and possibly not having a position in the future. And so he uh, unfortunately was in charge of the uh, password database. And so he basically locked down everyone's machines. Uh, and so they had to work through that. Uh, it obviously, it took a few days. Uh, it, it took some cyber specialists to be able to come in and to uh, basically work through what had been done. Um, and, and again, you, you don't know what people are thinking. Uh, we get that. But there has to be some redundancy built into, uh, you know, everything that you're trying to do from a preventative and even a restorative. You don't have one person that knows the run block. Your entire team should know how to execute on the run block. Um, and, and so you shouldn't have, you know, any single points of failure, if you will, with regards to how you're preventing and how you're restoring, um, you know, from potential events. Uh, this last one here, just kind of a, a heads up as you are bringing in uh, partners that are going to provide SaaS solutions to you. And that is, uh, this was an energy and petroleum organization uh, where they caught a partner. Uh, it was February of, uh, I have to go back a few years, I think it was 2016 or 17. Uh, in, in essence, it was when, um, uh, in February, where Amazon was down for about nine hours. And this energy and petroleum organization had a, a SaaS company come in uh, that was uh, getting ready to start uh, implementation of an ERP type system. Uh, basically, this uh, energy and petroleum company, they're, they're basically taking oil out of the ground and they have to account for every ounce of that. And because of how they were set up from a, a public-private perspective, they had to make sure they had daily audits of that. And this software was uh, in place to try to assist and help them with that. Uh, but when they went to do the demo, because Amazon was down, the SaaS provider had no demo they could do. Um, and so uh, the energy and petroleum company was very upset that 
you know, this software that's being used to regulate an industry, that's being used to record oil being drawn out of the, out of the fields on a daily basis, uh, they didn't have backup. They didn't have a disaster recovery plan in place. So again, throw something like that in there as it, it doesn't necessarily re relate to, uh, again, the legal industry, but law firms, as you are having folks come in and provide you SaaS solutions, they have APIs going everywhere into your systems that you uh, eventually may deem mission critical, make sure they're doing their own due diligence on your solutions, on their solutions, uh, so that you don't get caught in a situation where they take you down because they didn't have a, they didn't do their part in terms of um, having a backup or, or a recovery capability. Okay. So the resiliency scoring worksheet and, and Marsha, I think we've got one more poll that we'd like to do before we jump into that. Um, and, and this is really which of the following challenges affect your ability to deliver on security concerns? Uh, is it cultural? Is it the weak human link, uh, weak back and recovery, leadership and understanding, um, not understanding true risk? And so we talked through these. Uh, we'd like to get your take, your polls on kind of what, what you see the biggest challenge. Okay. So what we see here is that culturally, uh, we've never done it this way before. So a lot of change management, right? 46%. Uh, the weak human link, uh, security awareness is low, or people not following uh, you know, security policies uh, necessarily. Uh, and then leadership not understanding true risks and effort for proper prevention. Uh, and, and this is, you know, we, we put these statements in here because this is what we hear from our clients, really outside legal, but also um, really specific to legal, uh, would fall right along with it. So what we see from a cultural perspective and that we've never done it this way before uh, is, you know, when there's change and when, especially when that change forces human behavior to change and then also it, it costs money. So, you know, to the, you know, to the things that, that's hardest to get done is changing people's behavior and then getting approved for money to spend for that change in behavior. Um, so definitely I see why that's, uh, that's top of the list. Uh, leadership not understanding true risks. Uh, again, for, for a lot of years, uh, you, you know, law firms, you, you continually impress and do a phenomenal job of maintaining operational efficiency. And, and that's what you've been charged to do. And that operational efficiency is taking the budget that you've been giving and providing the best level of service that you can. And you guys do an amazing job of that. But when the world starts changing outside of it and your clients start asking you to change uh, within that, it becomes an even bigger challenge. And again, it goes back to it's going to cost money and it's going to force us to change our behavior. So I appreciate you guys uh, providing that feedback. Hopefully it's helpful to see uh, that there's a lot of common threads with regards to what some of the concerns and what the challenges are. So what do we want to do with all of this? Um, what we've got next is it's called a, re a resiliency scoring worksheet. Uh, and it, it's essentially a way of scoring your current resiliency posture. And this is, this is something that we've put together and we've utilized, but there are many different categories that you could put on this worksheet. This is just one that a client shared with us where, you know, they wanted to understand, uh, they wanted to be able to present and have a conversation around things such as, you know, uh, you know, device management, uh, multi-factor authentication, endpoint protection, uh, email security, DR, uh, backup, data loss prevention. So things that, you know, we've talked about through this time, um, but at, at the end of the day, these types of things, you know, these all point to very specific solutions, very specific solutions that if implemented may uh, force you to change the infrastructure the way you have it today and understanding, you know, what solutions might be in the marketplace. Uh, what vendors have you researched? Which ones do you think would be a good partner, both from a technology perspective, but also from a support perspective? Uh, and then also, in terms of planning to deploy, uh, you know, what, what time frame, what priorities do you have in terms of trying to get these solutions into the law firm? Uh, and if, obviously, if they've been implemented, kind of a checkbox of this was important to us, but we got this done in 2018, or we got this done this past year in 2019. So it, again, this is this list is not all uh, encompassing. 
uh, it, it's just directional in terms of some things that were important and we just want to bring that up uh, and again you could build this out to where uh, you know what challenges you may have if you don't implement this uh, you know so even the you know more or less the columns that we have there uh, you know could be modified and changed as well because no one knows your constituents better than what you do but the goal is is create a document um, that is uh, really conducive to what your needs are uh, and think of it in terms of preventative, uh, you know, restorative and possibly from a detection perspective and then understand, you know, where, where are you currently, you know, what's that current state and then which ones, you know, would you like to bring in to better facilitate building the type of resiliency you need within your organization. Okay, so I just want to take the last few minutes, and, and what I'd love to encourage you to do is, is hopefully you have some questions uh, for, uh, for us to continue the discussion, but I just want to talk a little bit about InterVision as a strategic services provider and some of the things that we do. So while you're hearing this 30, 60 second uh, commercial, if you wouldn't mind taking some time just to write a, uh, a quick question down that you may have with regards to what we've discussed today. Uh, so, as I mentioned, as a strategic services provider, uh, we focus on business outcomes uh, and we focus on what your business objectives are. So, we realize IT uh, over the last decade has really moved forward into the business. Uh, and, and what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, you know, uh, the attorneys may want certain types of automation for end user purposes uh, that's pulling you forward into those conversations. Uh, document management systems. Uh, that either are on-prem or you know are going to be moving to the cloud. It's going to involve you in making those changes and those modifications. New e-discovery tools with artificial intelligence and machine learning um, pull you more into what's that client experience going to be, what is that managing partner experience going to be. So by that very nature, we realize that if we re reverse engineer this, we can find the right technology, we can find the right partner, we can find the right solution that's the best fit for where you're trying to go with what you're trying to accomplish. So sometimes, you know, people ask the question, you know, tell me about your cloud journey. It's not really about a cloud journey. It's what is your business demanding of you? What is your what are your clients demanding of you? What is the, the executive team demanding of you? That really is what dictates the conversation. That's what dictates the technology. And so in, in terms of just our capability of just trying to be experts uh, with taking our experience in resiliency and applying it to you, uh, as well as making sure that we're uh, technology agnostic, there's lots of different types of technology out there. I mean, even for, you know, for replication and for backups, Veeam, Zerto, Commvault, you know, multiple products, they each have great uses. Um, and what we try to do is work with uh, clients to understand which one is the best fit for what you're looking to do, uh, realizing that uh, we're gonna put price aside and say ideally what would work, what is best for you, and, and then land where, uh, you know, where, land where that budget falls. And same thing with proactive, we really put a lot of emphasis on our support, uh, and that's, uh, that's actually uh, seen in our ability to uh, you know, be in the Gartner Magic Quadrant for things such as disaster recovery as a service. Uh, or be able to achieve the level of premier status with AWS. Uh, and, and so we really work towards understanding client objectives and then providing the best support that we can. In terms of what problems we solve, this is a sampling of the different types of solutions uh, that we have the ability to, uh, to provide. It's really under three key areas, so that is IT resiliency, which we've talked a lot about today, data center transformation, so we're very much working at the infrastructure level, um, and then workplace modernization. What are those types of things that are uh, beginning to move some things forward? And then our security services practice, uh, they were kind enough to put this information together for us, but our security practice really focuses in on understanding uh, where you're at today. They use the same preventative uh, uh, restorative and detection model to help assess where you're at and then also help you have that conversation internally as we talked about uh, previously. And then our, our goal is is that we really understand that clients uh, are in a, a constant state of transformation and you guys you guys know that. 
in terms of premise, you know, most clients today, they have things on-prem, they've got SaaS solutions, they've got cloud. No one is necessarily, or rarely do we see someone that's all in uh, with one approach. Uh, the right technology, it, it's a matter of, you know, what's going to fit, what's going to meet that business outcome as we talked about before, uh, to ensure that your, your mission is going to be successful. And also the right model. Again, going back to the level of staffing, um, on average with an IT law firms, uh, one of the things that, that we found to be helpful is that we can become that extension of your team. But that's not always the case. So we want to make sure that that model is anything from self-service um, or maybe it's just professional service for a one-time type of event uh, or maybe it's managed services ongoing so that you don't have to, you know, for example, disaster recovery of the service. Uh, you don't want to have to worry about managing that environment anymore. You want someone to take that on um, and just work with you on the testing and uh, more or less change management and the run book, but you don't want to have to manage the environment any longer. So we call these our three uniques, but basically, you know, what is the right premise, what is the right technology, and then what is the right model? So that brings us to the end. I really want to thank everybody for uh, their time today. Uh, hopefully we've got a few questions uh, and most certainly um, would like you to fill out the evaluation. Uh, we're, we're here to provide the information that you'd like to hear uh, about. Uh, and so we heard loud and clear that, you know, having the right conversation, give me a framework, give me a checklist uh, was something that was of value. Hopefully you found some value today. Um, but the evaluations are just so helpful. So any feedback you can provide there, please take the time to do so. Um, but I'll look to Marsha to see if we have some questions. Yes, um, and we do have a question um, from Dave King. Um, for mid to small firms, where do you start? Is there an outline of how to get started? Uh, the, the answer is, is yes. Uh, and, and so it, for a small to medium sized firm, um, I'll give you a good example. We, we were working with a mid-sized firm uh, or medium firm in Chicago of about 45, 46 attorneys. And we literally started with um, that, uh, the, the two-pronged approach. And so from the preventative slide that you saw, they put together a checklist of what they had and what they were looking to utilize. And then they did the same on the restorative side. And then they were basically doing internal DR uh, they're actually using Zerto and going from, um, you know, basically one office to another. Um, and they would even say, I'm using the term offices loosely there a little bit. But um, um, so they had that in place, but they were able to use uh, that framework to say, okay, here, you know, here's the types of firewalls that we have today. We should be thinking about moving to these types of firewalls. And here's why, because it will provide the value of security that we're looking for for these, you know, for these clients. On the restorative side, they were able to say, you know, we're actually doing pretty good there. We've got a good replication tool in place. We can recover, but they were able to have the discussion of, however, uh, from a storage perspective, we're only able to go back a few hours. We'd like to be able to go back a few days. So then they were able to get provision and dollars for additional storage at that second site. Um, and then detection, just to be very transparent, detection was out of their reach in terms of cost, um, but they were very happy with the fact that they were able to get some prevention dollars that they otherwise wouldn't have gotten, and they were able to get the storage uh, for the replication piece. And, and so um, I think these slides are made available, Marsha, uh, on the Delta website. So I encourage you to take a look at that two-pronged approach and kind of build out your own preventative, restorative, and detection uh, so that, uh, it, and if you have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out. Myself or, or one of our solution architects would be more than happy to help you kind of fill that in. Um, but we think that's a good, good place to start. It doesn't look like we have any more questions at this time, but please do submit. Okay. All right. Um, well, thank you, Pat, for the great presentation and InterVision for sponsoring. Um, and to our members, please do take the evaluations if you have not done so already. And we will be posting the recording along with the deck within um, a day or two. Well, Marcia, thank you very much for the opportunity. It was great and uh, look forward to our next time together.